All right, I'll let you record it, Frank. That way we don't have duplicates there. Yeah, it should be working now. Okay, yeah, it's showing it's showing you as recording on my participant list, so I think it's going. All right, well, the, the waiting room has slowed down a little bit, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll let folks in as, as they come in. Um, welcome to the first of the Wednesday webinar series for the summer with the CMA um, group. We're really glad to have all of you there. Um, if you missed before, uh, my name is Kyle Lawrence. I'm the current CMA president. Um, I've been on the CMA board for several years. I attended CMA back in 2016 or 17, I believe, and I more or less joined the board at the next meeting. So I've been around for a while. Um, I really appreciate everything CMA does. Um, I, I enjoy the ongoing learning opportunities we provide, and um, I'm glad you all are here to continue to um, network and continue to learn and grow as uh, the managers in, in the state. Um, so what we're going to do today, uh, we have our speaker, Marissa, she's ready to go at 1030. So right before then, uh, we are going to do our uh, voting for our board members. We've got um, three nominees and one position open. Uh, let me share my screen just so you guys can see the agenda for today. All right. Can you all see that okay? Give me a little thumbs up or say something in the chat. I can see it, Carl. Awesome, thanks, Dom. All right. So uh, you can see we've got a real brief agenda today. This is a little bit like how the board meetings go. So if you're ever interested in attending a board meeting, please reach out to me. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, invite you to one so you can see how things go. Um, also, if you're uh, interested in being an ambassador for your agency, um, please reach out to me as well. The ambassadors attend um, the board meetings with, with us and then uh, you know, you basically go back to your agency and spread the good news about CMA to the folks in your agency who have attended, uh, you know, what's going on, let them know about learning opportunities or uh, other opportunities that, that may come up. Um, and, and we'll just sort of uh, help, you guys will help us pass along the information. It's also a good uh, chance for you to sort of um, Talk to folks in your agency that may be interested in CMI but haven't attended it before. Um, so you guys can kind of let them know what's going on and, and how that's all going, going to go. Uh, so it is 10.08. I'll officially call our meeting to order. Uh, I've already done some of the welcome and introduction already. Um, if real quick, could the members of the CMA board, um, if you guys could unmute and introduce yourselves to uh, the, the group. Good morning, everyone. I'm Frank Schneider from the Department of General Services. I'm the executive director for the Office of Procurement Services. And I've been on as a vice president for the CMA board for two years now. Hey, good Hi. morning. Um, this is Chiquita Hills. I'm the Director of Collections for Virginia Department of Taxation. I've been with the agency for almost three years now. Um, I went through CMI, I think October 2021. Um, I serve as the uh, social media chair. So I do a lot of the Facebook, the um, LinkedIn account. Um, we'll, of course, we'll share some of those handles uh, during the presentation or afterwards so that you guys can follow our social media pages. But um, it's been a great opportunity to network and grow as a leader. So I hope that you um, get something from this training today. And if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to anybody here. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dominic Cristello. Uh, I'm the Director of Technology Services at uh, Virginia Housing 
Uh, I've been here for about three years. Uh, I was a graduate of CMI in uh, December of 21, along with, I was actually in uh, Frank's uh, CMI class. Um, uh, I often travel to the graduations. Uh, I enjoy it. I like make, meeting uh, the new CMI graduates and helping to spread uh, the message around uh, what CMA is and possible opportunities for them. Good morning, all. I'm Letitia Burrell, and I am with the Department of Social Services as an Associate Director Senior, and I graduated from the CMI um, program in April of 2017, I believe. I don't have my certificate in front of me, but um, I believe it was 2017. And I um, enjoy being a board member, um, looking for outreach activities. We've supported Feed More. We have done a school supply drive during the um, December timeframe and um, helping to schedule classes such as this. And it's a great way, as Chiquita said, to build leadership opportunities. And I'm looking forward to doing other activities with the other board members as well. So thank you and enjoy today's program. Good morning. I am Paige Pearson. I am the public information officer for the Department of Wildlife Resources. I've been here for about six years. I did CMI in March of 19, I believe. Um, and I've been on the board since May of 2021, I think. So excited to have you guys here. Thanks for coming. Good morning. I'm Deborah Correll. I'm retired from the Department of Medical Assistance Services. Uh, I was with the state of Virginia for 35 years. I attended CMI in June of 2018. And I hope you enjoy the presentation today and the following presentations that we will be having in the upcoming months. It's a great opportunity to learn so much um, to enhance your management skills. Thank you. We're all very jealous of Deborah. She she lets us know what it's like on the other side. <laughs> Was there any other board members that are on uh, that we may have missed? I think I'm beautiful. Can't see everybody. Can you guys see me? Let's see. I think I can. Yeah, we can see you, Tashawn. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm the Tashawn Harris Borgi with DARS. I am the immediate past president of CMA, and welcome everyone. And I serve on the advisory committee. All right, and last but not least, Mandy, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am Mandy Fowler. I am the business development liaison at PMG and the liaison between CMA, the CMI Alumni Association, and um, the BC Wilder School. So thank you, everyone, for coming. I am glad you all are here, and I can't wait for the rest of the Webinar Wednesday Summer Series. Excellent. Yeah, we, we are excited about this series. I think we've got some excellent speakers uh, coming up uh, for the rest of the summer. We'll talk about those at the end. Um, so now I want to move into the only real business that we have uh, other than Marissa speaking today, which is the election of uh, the new board member for the CMA group. Um, so for those of you that don't know, board members serve two-year terms um, and have to be reelected every two years. Uh, it just so happens with the way COVID worked, um, everyone got re-voted on last year, so we are all in the middle of our two-year term, um, but we did have someone um, resign from the board this year, so we have a position to fill, um, and so we are going to be voting to fill that position. Uh, board members, for anyone who's interested in the future, uh, we have monthly board meetings, usually virtually, but we do throw an in-person meeting in there from time to time um, as well, because we like to get together and see each other and chat. 
Um, but basically we just plan our different um, opportunities for the CMA group throughout the year. So, uh, oh, good, we got the uh, social medias in the chat as well. Um, so, you know, we, we plan this, this webinar summer series, we plan the annual meeting, um, we plan, as um, someone mentioned, we plan our outreach stuff. So we, you know, figure out what we're going to do and do some community service together. Um, and then just sort of talk about anything else that we need to. So it's a, it's an excellent group. Um, it's great to sort of network uh, and continue on um, with some of those things that you learned in CMI and, and um, we're, we're a fun group. So if you're ever interested, like I said before, in attending, please let us know, reach out to any one of us and we're happy to invite you so you can kind of see, uh, see what, what it's like. So I'm gonna go in, can everyone see the screen with the new board member nominees? I'm seeing yeses, okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to give uh, the person's name and the brief um, bio biography that they gave me. If that person is here, if you wanna add anything else when I'm done, please let us know. Uh, these are in no particular, well, they're in alphabetical order, so it's not necessarily particular order, but um, no order of preference, I should say. They're just alphabetical. So I'm going to go ahead and share it on the screen and then read it for everybody. Afterwards, I have a poll set up in um, the Zoom. And those of you who are CMA um, members, so anyone who has graduated um, from the CMA program in the past, uh, you're welcome to vote. So we'll have the poll open for like um, five to 10 minutes. And afterwards, we'll announce the, the winner. All right, so the first nominee we have is Timothy Amberman. Um, he is an application development manager with the Department of Housing. He has 10 plus years IT manager experience uh, with web design, front end, back end development, infrastructure, and operations experience. Uh, for state government, he's worked eight months so far at Virginia Housing, as well as eight years at the Department of Treasury and one year at VCU. Um, he's also a graduate of the Fundamentals for Supervisors and the CMI programs. On a personal note, he's an avid home cook and likes to enjoy Richmond's vast food and drink scene. And he plays at, he remains active by playing soccer outdoor with CVSA and indoor soccer at SCOR. Uh, Timothy, are you on and would you like to add anything else to that? All right, uh, moving on to Mina Sims. So next nominee we have is Nina Sims. She's the Director of Marketing and Public Relations with the Community College Workforce Alliance at Reynolds Community College. Um, since 2007, Nina has served as Director of Marketing and Public Relations at the Community College Workforce Alliance, uh, the Workforce Development Division of Bright Point and Reynolds Community Colleges. There, she supports efforts including advertising, public relations, public development, website management, digital campaigns, and community outreach. Prior to CCWA, she was the Director of Marketing at the Virginia Department of Business Assistance, where she led the agency's quarterly seminar management, annual business appreciation week activities, media relations, and promotional campaigns for small business owners. Uh, Nina began her career of service to the Commonwealth more than 25 years ago as a senior marketing associate with the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, where she coordinated the agency's trade show presence, both domestic and international, to assist statewide leaders in the recruitment of business and industry. Nina is a native of Richmond region and holds a bachelor degree in mass communications and public relations from VCU and a graduate certificate in digital marketing from UVA. Um, in addition to her job responsibilities, Nina has been an active board member of the Junior League of Richmond, Communities and Schools, Richmond, uh, the VCU Alumni Association, the United Way, and the Richmond Chapter of the Public Relations Society of America, to name a few. She is an April 2006 graduate of the CMI Institute. All right. Um, Nina, are you there? Is there anything else you would like to 
add. All right, not hearing anything, so we'll move on to Marcy Thornhill. Our last nominee for the opening for the board position is Marcy Thornhill. She's a customer account manager with VITA, <clears throat> Virginia Information Technologies Agency. She states her goal is to reach youth that would not have access resources in their area. We want to assist youth in rural, urban, and low-income communities, those in failing school districts, children of deceased or incarcerated parents, teenage parents, and those currently placed in group home or alternative living environments. Marcy is the founder and CEO of College and Career for Youth. Currently, she is employed as a customer account manager with the Virginia Information Technology Agency, and she's also a former adjunct professor at VCU, an accomplished author and active member of the community. She received her Bachelor of Science in Business from Virginia Commonwealth University, a master's in human resource management, and a second master's in education from Strayer University. Marcy, are you there? And would do you have anything you'd like to add? Kyle, oh, this is Tish. I think we have to come back to this. Um, and maybe make sure that they're able to um, get into the meeting. So we'll. Um, I've, I think we're okay. We've got several people that are in. I know they got the invite and I reached out to them about this. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think I think we're okay because uh, I reached out to them yesterday. We had one nominee drop out, um, but the other three, um, I didn't hear anything back about dropping out. So I think we're okay. All right. So um, with that being said, uh, we'll go ahead now to the voting. I'm going to start a poll. Again, please only vote if you are a CMA graduate. Um, if you are, then you're more than welcome to vote and you should see one coming up in uh, the board election. It's titled CMA board election. It's gonna pop up in the Zoom. Just select your choice for who you would like to be the board member. Um, I'm gonna leave the board open and uh, myself on mute for the next um, five to 10 minutes uh, just to give everyone time to make their choice and then uh, we'll announce the winner and then hopefully we should be uh, ready to move on to Marissa.
All right, this is your two minute warning. I got two minutes to get those last couple votes in. If you need to see any bios, please let me know in the chat and I'll be happy to show that to you. All right, the polling has ended. Uh, we will share those results at the end. Um, we are just going to wait. Uh, Marissa should be in here um, in just a minute or two, and I'll introduce her and we'll get going. So if we want to take a five minute break, uh, everyone's welcome to take a step back if you need it, refill drinks, uh, use the restroom, um, come on back around 1035 and we'll be ready to go. All right, thanks everyone. Um, share it, that way I don't have to tell you like, hey, next slide, next slide. Okay, perfect. You should you should have that ability now um, as co-host, but let me know if it's not working. Are you guys ready for me to start? Uh, we're on a uh, we're on a little bit of a break. I think people should be coming back now. Um, so I'm going to do just a real quick introduction of who you are, and then we'll let you go for it. Okay, perfect. So this is good timing. Okay, let me pull up the PowerPoint. All right, while she's doing that, I think we have folks should be coming back. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce Marissa Gilbert. Um, Marissa has over 15 years experience of integrated communications and coaching experience across many industries, including education, real estate, and healthcare. Um, her personal journey as a cancer survivor led her to pursue a career as a clinical social worker. Um, she has delivered presentations and facilitated workshops in a variety of mental health and wellness areas. Most recent topics include navigating grief, anxiety and depression, reduction, managing chronic pain, stress management and burnout, building healthy coping skills and trauma-informed care. Uh, so lots of great things there. Um, Marissa, today, as you guys know, is talking about neurodiversity. We're going to talk about how exciting brains are and we're going to how we can celebrate and include neurodiversity better in the workplace. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Marissa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. I am so excited to be here. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah? Okay. I'm at my office. 
Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you again for um, introducing me. I am really uh, excited to be here and just really glad to be um, sharing this topic uh, with everyone and um, grateful that all this worked out. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Everyone can see my screen? We're yep, good? we can. Okay, perfect. Um, and Kyle, just to confirm, we're starting um, around 10.38, so I have about, we have about like 45 minutes, an hour? Yep, yeah, we've got about that long and a little bit longer if you want it, but it's up to okay. you. Okay, well, we're all really busy, so we won't, <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens, right? <clears throat> we'll see what shows up. That's the great thing about Zoom, right? We'll just see what happens. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. We'll longer, maybe we'll go shorter, we'll just, we'll go with it, right? <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, awesome. So, uh, like Kyle shared, my name is Marissa, um, and I am going to be talking with you guys to everyone today um, about neurodiversity. So, with that, can you up your volume just a little bit, Marissa? It's at the highest. I can okay. try to talk even louder. Yeah, maybe just speak a little bit louder. Yeah, I'll, you know what? I have a low voice, so sometimes it feels like I'm screaming, in the <laughs> head, but I'm probably just talking really low to everybody else. So I'll scream. Um, we'll we'll let you know if you're screaming too bad. And uh, for the, for the members, we are recording, so we'll have that available if you miss anything later. Perfect. So yeah, if it sounds like I'm screaming, just let me know. <laughs> um. Okay, awesome. So what we're going to talk about today um, is neurodiversity. So, um, you know, for starters, just what is neurodiversity, right? Like what is a baseline definition? Um, and really what is the difference between neurodiversity <laughs> and this idea of, um, you know, being neurodivergent and neurotypical, right? Um, and then different types of neurodivergence. Um, and then really the visible and um, invisible differences, because when things are going on in our brains, it's, you know, you can't tell, right? You can't tell if, you know, person A and person B, because you can't tell from looking at them what's happening in their brain. Um, and then challenges um, within neurodiversity, especially specifically in the workplace, um, considerations and accommodations and, um, really just celebrating and embracing neurodiversity and digging into uh, the benefits in the workplace. And um, I really want this to be as interactive as possible. So please, 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 um, you know, don't hesitate to jump in and I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll have a few times throughout where I'll be opening up for um, just kind of discussion questions um, and we can all kind of, you know, make this, you know, because I don't want to hear, not just because I have a low voice, but I don't want to hear my own voice throughout this, right? That's no fun for me or for you. Um, so, um, okay. So what is neurodiversity? And can you guys hear me, Kyle? Can you hear me better? Okay. So what is neurodiversity? So this term was coined um, by Judy Singer, who is an Australian social scientist, and it was first coined um, in the 90s. So this is a rel in the 1990s. So this is a relatively newer term. And Judy Singer um, is on the um, autism spectrum, and she really crafted this concept and this ideology um, in 1998. And so it's a blend of the words neurological and diversity, kind of, you know, hybrid combo, right? Mashup. Um, and, you know, really the, in essence, it's this idea that all of our brains work differently. And it doesn't mean that one way is better or worse or broken than another, it's just different. And what does that really mean? Because when we do think of the word diversity, you know, we typically think about things that uh, we can see, right? You know, race, gender, ethnicity, and so Judy Singer really blended these terms to advocate that our brains are different and that everyone should be treated equally, whether you are neurodivergent or neurotypical. 
um, and that be in, in all areas of your life, in the workplace, at home, um, socially. Um, and so really neuro uh, differences are recognized and appreciated socially as a social category, um, just like we celebrate and we discuss and we really dig into ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, disability status. Um, and so, you know, and on the same level as that of really thinking through what does that mean and what does that mean for different people? Because it's not one size fits all. So now what is like the big difference, right? You know, you hear these terms a lot and we're probably, some of us are probably like, oh, another, another new term, right? Another new term to, um, to remember, to understand. So really in essence, um, you know, when you're neurotypical, right? It's kind of that typical intellectual and cognitive development. You know, your physical, verbal, intellectual, social, it's at a, you know, specific pace and you're kind of meeting these like standard accepted milestones for development, um, common expected physical behaviors. You're able to navigate, you know, social situations pretty commonly, um, you know, regular communication skills. Sure, you, you know, we all still go through that uh, awkward middle school phase, right? But um, you're able to, you know, establish your social connections, like, you know, friendships, you know, dating more easily. Um, so neurodivergent, in essence, is, you know, maybe struggling a little bit more with intellectual and cognitive, like maybe, you know, reading is a little bit harder or, or math or the concepts or comprehension. Um, it could also mean struggling with maybe softer skills like social interactions and pacing and social interactions and, you know, feeling, you know, anxiety about what to say. Um, and it also can include physical behaviors. So, you know, tips or, or rocking or having kind of like irregular hand movements out of the, you know, talking with your hands type of thing. And so it's really how we as humans are perceiving and understanding the world and those around us and really in this constant negotiation of boundaries. So, um, you know, by culture though, the word typical also really can, can change, right? So um, would love to hear from everyone, you know, we often take different paths to the same result. Like has anyone, you know, have an example of like a completely different approach um, to like, hearing neurodivergent or neurotypical or um, anything that they'd like to share to, you know, add to these definitions or things that have helped them um, clarify to and kind of like make these definitions um, simpler and kind of easier to, you know, understand or something that, you know, helps them. And you can either put it in the chat or, I don't know, Kyle, if that's easier or if you want to put it in the chat, then I can share it. Yep, yeah, we're uh, monitoring the chat. So uh, folks want to do that, that may be the easiest way. Thanks, Jaquita. Yeah. Um, ADHD and struggling with reading, but gifted in math. And, you know, looking and approaching him differently. So that is um, such a great example um, and something that we're going to be touching upon throughout the, you know, throughout this presentation is we often too um, in like neurodivergent, you might struggle with one thing, but you're very, very gifted in another. And so there's a lot of benefits, right? And so um, we just need to look at and approach how people learn differently and you really can then um, emphasize all the benefits, right? Versus looking at the deficits of, oh, you know, my son struggles with reading, so I'm going to focus on that, right? So thank you. We can keep keep it moving because this is actually a great segue um, to the next slide that we're going to, am I still good on volume? I saw George said more volume. Am I good? Good. Okay, so that's a great segue um, because there's a lot of different types of neurodivergence. So, you know, 
especially as this term has um, gotten more and more commonplace. Um, oh, thanks, George. <laughs> um, as this term has become more and more commonplace, right? Neurodivergence. So, you know, it's kind of, it kind of came, I don't know about a lot of people, but if I, you know, I'm in the mental health field, I work with a, a lot of people who have ADHD and, and anxiety. So that's why I've heard about it more. But the term kind of also feels like, you know, it came out of, out of the blue, right? All of a sudden, neurodivergence is everywhere. And there's a lot of different types that fall under this neurodivergent umbrella. So um, rather than looking for like a cure, um, neurodiversity advocates really um, are working to promote kind of like social support systems and how, again, you know, like we had just touched upon, can we really um, augment and look at people's strengths um, and really play to those strengths um, and looking at it in terms of social tendencies, the same way, right, that we, you know, nowadays, like introvert and extrovert, right? There's been so much research done about, you know, introverts and the differences. There's a great book about um, being an introvert called Quiet. And we don't, you know, we don't say, well, you're not going to be as successful as an introvert because you're quieter, right? We've really done a lot of research and understanding in the workplace, especially how we can really, um, you know, how introverts and all of their strengths and what they bring to the table and how that really can balance with extroverts, right? And how you can um, have them on teams and really work so well together. And it's really kind of the same idea um, around neurodivergence. So just to do kind of a quick overview of everything that really falls under neurodivergence right now. So there is um, on the autism spectrum, um, there is, you know, autism is a wide spectrum and that really impacts you know, autism is a more of a developmental disorder that affects communication and behavior. And under autism is Asperger's, um, which, you know, uh, people have probably heard of, but that affects more of ability to socialize and communicate. Um, and then there's also pathological demand avoidance, which is a more of an avoidance. And then, you know, there's uh, several learning disabilities, like, um, you know, I won't read all of them. Um, mostly because I'll probably butcher to how they're said, uh, but, but there's several different learning disabilities. Um, I think probably what a lot of people are most familiar with, um, dyslexia. Um, I remember even 20 years ago, right? Um, you know, my best friend from high school was in her, you know, mid to late twenties before, you know, she finally was diagnosed with dyslexia because 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, dyslexia wasn't even being diagnosed as much in schools and um, it was just kind of like oh well I guess you can't you know read as much right um, and so there's been even great advances with understanding you know that diagnosis and how to really promote systems and help people and to that end um, ADHD um, ADD um, has um, you know if you're on TikTok for even five seconds you're probably getting fed um, some kind of ADHD um, video, right? And so um, ADHD has really exploded in terms of how we um, really are understanding ADHD, how we're diagnosing ADHD, what has masked ADHD in the past, and how we can really appreciate um, ADHD and, and in the workplace. Because there's all kinds of like hacks and tricks and workarounds um, for um, ADHD that um, we now can really celebrate and are really, really helpful versus, oh, you know, you just don't concentrate or, oh, you're just not motivated. Um, because there, you know, it really does affect like our ability really to focus, right, and impulsiveness. Um, and, you know, often, and, you know, we can get to this in a minute, is I see a lot um, of overlap between ADHD and anxiety. And so, lots of people um, have anxiety and um, they've often been masking, you know, dyslexia or ADHD or things like that their whole lives. Um, and it's really shown as anxiety. And anxiety actually is normally coupled a lot of the time with a lot of these other types of neurodivergence. Um, and then, you know, Tourette's is this ability to regulate your movement, 
um, and processing um, sensory, mirrors Erlen syndrome, it's per perceptual, visual. Um, and then, um, you know, we're, we're very familiar, a lot of people are familiar with, you know, OCD is that, you know, unreasonable thoughts and fears leading to compulsive behaviors. There was this great movie uh, from the late 90s, I might be dating myself, um, called As Good As It Gets. And with Jack Nicholson, he had OCD and, you know, it's a good uh, movie that really talks about OCD. Um, and then anxiety, right? I mean, anxiety is, you know, probably the thing on here that if I had to do a poll, people either relate to the most, know someone who has it. Um, if you didn't have it before COVID, you probably have it, some form of it now, right? Um, and really anxiety um really um it can be anything from just like a social you know nervousness before presentation to that intense excessive persistent worry and fear that's really affecting your everyday functioning and your everyday situations um so just a question that i want to throw out to everyone is um you know what are ways that you know thinking of this of this list right um you know, having, uh, you know, people you might know, or even people that you don't, you haven't met yet, um, having a neurodiverse colleague, you know, might differ um, from having a family or friend um, who's neurodiverse, right? How would that um, be different for you in that experience? Don't all jump in at once. I'll go ahead if you can hear me. I can, thank you so much. Okay, okay. sure. So um, I asked my husband's permission before saying anything. <laughs> so I take a second. Uh, so I have um, a husband with ADHD and a child with ADHD. And it's been very interesting in giving them space to tell me what works for them instead of trying to do it the way that it works for me. And oftentimes that means giving them more time to do it, not open-ended, but more time. And I think that um, I have several staff as well who with me and adapting that from a leadership standpoint as to don't give them really short, quick turnarounds unless you want to panic them, <laughs> but also giving them strict boundaries to operate in. They do pretty well with that and then giving them projects where they can be very creative. So I think it's, you know, I. You can apply some of the same in the workplace as you do at home, but understanding that just because it works for you or because it works for my husband, it doesn't necessarily work for my daughter and, and really taking the time to listen and allow the strategies and the tools that they have in place to function with the capacity of your workplace or home. Yeah, you cut out a little, but I, but thank you so much for sharing. I mean, I think really um, the great point you're making is just how important it is for us to be like flexible and adaptable, right? and to be nimble and not, you know, stuck in this. Also, just because you have ADHD, then this means that I have to treat everybody with ADHD in my life one way, right? Um, where, you know, people, um, they are adapt to different tools and different um, ways of learning. And it's like trying different things. And I think to your point, um, you know, I uh, personally have ADHD and um, was diagnosed later in life. And um, what works for me at work is different than works for me at home, right? And at work, the systems and the structures, um, just like, you know, at home. And so it's helpful um, to just be really open-minded um, like you shared. And so I'm, thank you so much for sharing. We really appreciate that. And we have, oh. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, Mary, yeah. For someone who rambles, I concentrate on the topic thread and bring them back to the point when they go off tangent. Yes, thank you. Yeah, 
Exactly. It's like that gentle redirecting, right? Um, because often too, people that have like, you know, challenges regulating impulsivity, a lot of it is they're really excited, right, to talk about something. And so they're not thinking, oh, I've just gone off, you know, into on a tangent. And so in a gentle way, um, you know, bringing back to the back to the point, you know, we're there to kind of help them too, right? We help each other. And they're appreciating that. Um, so thank you so much, Mary. That's a great point. Jaquita, yeah, I think I have more patience for people outside of at work. Yeah, yes. That is, oh, yeah. Who else is there that we have more patience for people, for strangers, than we do for <laughs> our loved ones, right? Is that just me? <laughs> yeah. um, I know that might, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, it's not strange at all. I, yeah, I, exactly. You find yourself being less patient with your kids or husband than other people and to consciously remind yourself they're important and it's different. But it doesn't mean it's wrong. I love that point. It's not, it's not bad or good, right? It's not wrong or right. There's no or in that, right? Um, it's not wrong. It's just, it's an and statement. It's just a different thing. And that is um, a really, really helpful thing to acknowledge out loud. Um, that we often can give a lot more grace um, to strangers or coworkers um, than to people we live with or loved ones, right? Um, and so that's really helpful to acknowledge and to name. Um, and then we can remind ourselves that, um, you know, it's annoying, right? Because at home, it's annoying when things pile up and things are done differently. And so the first step is really acknowledging it. So thank you so much. Um, Kyle. Yeah, it's supporting people too with their treatment, right? And knowing that, you know, medication is helpful, right? And you support that and know that he takes medication for ADHD, just like you would take for blood pressure, any other medical thing, right? Um, and so it's just like that. It's just something else that you maintain and that he's able and, you know, he's fortunate to have an employer that he can be open with about that too, that, hey, you know, on a day that he might not have taken his meds, you know, you know that it's not him slacking off, right? And he can be open and honest and feel comfortable in that space to share with you. Um, so thank you, thank you everyone. These are all really great. So um, visible and invisible differences. You know, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? Um, and so, you know, again, when it comes to the brain, until we start getting to know or talking to someone, we don't know what's happening under the hood, right? We can't, unfortunately, there is no way to just meet someone and, you know, we're not like um, robots yet where we can like point something at their brain and be like, oh, this part of the amygdala is lighting up. So this must mean that they have A, B, and C. Um, so, a few more just kind of questions is, you know, and I, you know, Kyle touched upon this is, you know, what do we do if we think someone we know is neurodivergent and has anyone, you know, disclosed their neurodiversity to you? And, you know, did that change anything about that working or personal relationship? And if you want to sit on that for a minute, there's, um, an activity that, <clears throat> please. Um, can you hear me? I was just gonna add, I had an employee that it became very apparent that the employee was very ADHD and um, she um, had very, a lot of difficulty completing tasks and she put post-it notes and everything all over her room and she was very scattered and, I, you know, finally broached it like, you know, I don't know, you know, everything's going on, but I said, I have a son who's ADHD and I see some behaviors that, you know, may ha have issues while you're having issues completing tasks and everything. And so I was trying to be, you know, very helpful to her as potentially a vehicle. And she basically said, my parents said that I should never do that. Um, because an employer can hold that against me if I take 
medicine or anything like this. And I told her, I said, an employer cannot, if you are being treated for a condition, you know, discriminate against you. But if you can't complete your work and you can't do your work, then yes, it will have an impact on your on your job and your performance and everything. Unfortunately, she never would go. I subsequently had to let her go. And she was very, um, uh, and I even gave her like two weeks to try to find another job, you know, so that she could be applying for a job while she was looking for a job and tried to do a lot of things for her. And I found that it just, she wasn't receptive at all. And she actually was very counterproductive to done that really I should have just let her go immediately but that was one of those live and learn lessons and uh but I think that that you know those are some of the issues you get with in a in a workplace when you're trying to be cognizant of a person's disability or their you know you just got to tread so lightly in terms of trying to help them yeah thank you and that is a really great example too of the idea that we can do like any any disability or challenge we can only do what's in our control right we're not in the results business and so you you know did what you could do that was in your control but you know often sometimes people are not maybe ready right to on their own um and to kind of process or you know do things to manage it right um, and so it's, you know, giving them resources and that's what we're, you know, doing today is education and resources um, and, um, you know, knowing that it's not always going to be like in a, in a tidy box with a bow, right, where that person's going to say, oh, thank you for being so open-minded, great, I, you know, and it all is the perfect outcome, right, and now you have that experience. So thank you so much for sharing that. Does anyone else have anything they want to share right now? I would just like to, one of the things also that was uh, the co-occurrence, I guess, of ADHD and things like, I've heard about Asperger's and, and things. And so I guess the question comes is, when is it ADHD and when is it like something additional, because one of the things I find often with my son is the inability to sometimes pick up on social cues or to um, to change behavior when it's obviously detrimental to him, and yet it's almost like he doesn't see it. Yes, so there's a lot of overlap to between social anxiety and. ADHD and Asperger's and a lot of the time it falls to in like the diagnosis right is that um, ADHD can or can mask certain things and so it could really be like a social anxiety um, that's not being treated or they're you know so doing um, behavior therapy or different things um, and tools around more of the like social anxieties that you're not seeing. Like for example, I had, um, I have a client who was diagnosed with ADHD um, in like second or third grade. And um, it wasn't until college where she got retested for ADHD for her accommodations, where it turned out that she didn't have ADHD and this particular client had social anxiety. Um, the whole time and it wasn't ADHD. And so um, it's being really, you know, sensitive to the fact that sometimes we're not perfect in our diagnosis. And so getting those testing um, or, you know, the comorbidity to your point is masking another, another thing, right. That potentially um, could also be treated. That's like under the hood that could um, actually make one thing, you know, more prevalent or less prevalent. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Karen. And we can talk more after. I'd be, you know, curious to chat more. Um, yes, um, exactly, Tiffany. You can be diagnosed with 
ADHD and autism and anxiety. And so you can be on the spectrum of autism and, and it's, you know, AUHD is kind of the trendy acronym um, of being kind of, of having both. And yes, thank you, Mary, a checklist. Checklists are great or focus plans. A lot of people um, with ADHD in particular are very visual learners. Um, so having that visual and knowing that, you know what, I'm making, you know, I'm making steps towards this goal and breaking it down so it doesn't seem as overwhelming is huge. And yes, staying in our, wow, thanks guys. Everyone's getting into it now. <laughs> Staying in our lanes and giving grace if someone has not been to a doctor or has not shared their health status. Yes, and that is, a, is key is we're not, you know, again, we're not in the results business and we're also not in the, you know, the diagnosis business, right? Where you can, and I think sometimes it is possible to shy away from wanting to have these conversations in the workplace because we think that, well, I don't, you know, I'm not their therapist and I don't want that. And, and you can have those conversations without, um, you know, coming across as, you know, I've noticed that, you know, I went to a training and I heard that you have three out of these four symptoms that have ADHD. And so I've diagnosed you with ADHD. Um, so being mindful of that. Um, seasonal depression at work. We can, if we have time, um, we can get to that at the end. That's a great question, Mary. And yes, thank you, Sarah. Being sensitive about discussing undiagnosed issues with our employees. We can encourage resources in different ways to approach a topic, but I'm not sure that we should really ever say that, they, that we think they have something. Yes. Yes, it, not until an employee like Kyle's earlier example comes to you and says, hey, I have, you know, ADHD and I'm taking these medications and then, you know, um, having empathy in that dialogue, you, you know, you don't, you can maybe see similarities at work of people, but it's never about um, diagnosing them because, again, then people also become even more um, self-conscious and want to shut down. And yes, yes, Sudharma, I can definitely do that. And I can send some more resources about just the different um, disorders. Um, okay, great. Well, just wanted to do a quick activity. Can everyone, oh, yep. Thank you, Kyle. Can everyone um just, you know, jot down like the words, names, or images. I'm going to stop my share for a second so we can all kind of see each other. That would be a little bit cozier. Um, can we all just like, I'm going to say some words, and I just want you to jot down what word or name or image comes to mind when you hear the word or statement that I'm going to say, okay? Sound good? So just the first thing that comes to mind. All right, so the first word is autistic. Disabled. Retarded. Crazy. Someone who is unstable. Last one, high functioning. Okay. So would love to hear from people, right? About the words that have come to mind when we say those things, because those things are often 
prejudgments, right? Where, you know, we think negatively about it if we don't know it, or we think, you know, like people said in the chat, cruel, right? They can also be cruel words that we don't use anymore to describe people. So what else came to mind with some of these words? Disabled, limited. Yeah, did anybody else think of limited? Yes. Hey, this is Chiquita. I, when I heard disabled um, and also high functioning, I was thinking about um, the situation I kind of shared with my son. Generally, when someone has um, a weakness or um, they generally have a strength in something else. So my mind kind of went there like, okay, so if um, they may have a deficiency with their legs. They generally have very strong arms and very strong upper bodies. So I kind of thought about, okay, well, you know, I just thought about different scenarios and different people um, in that and just sharing a little bit. Um, so my my kids are very athletic. We got a track meet this weekend. Um, my daughter is pretty good at what she does. But um, when she went to do the long jump, she didn't jump as far as she normally does. The next girl comes up behind her like jumps maybe two feet beyond her and she didn't have any hands like we didn't notice until after she jumped but it was just remarkable and that much more remarkable um but I mean I thought about that and how most individuals that have let's say a um opportunity in one area they're stronger somewhere else back to my son with the ADHD with reading like he's he struggles with reading but is gifted in math so that's what I thought about yeah thank you that's such a good example. That actually makes me think of, um, there's this great Peloton instructor who, ha you know, has one arm, right? And, you know, you know, he's phenomenal at so many things. But if we prejudge, right, if that, oh, well, and he's a strength trainer. So if you have that prejudgment, like the, you know, track meet, that only people that, you know, were, looked the way we thought they could look, right? were able to do physical things, then we'd be missing out on so much. Um, and, you know, in general, the list kind of speaks to also is just this idea, again, of visible versus, you know, unvisible um, differences, right? Because, you know, you also can be high functioning, right? And have anxiety. You know, I have, a, I have a lot of people who say, well, I'm a high, I have high functioning anxiety, right? Well, you still have anxiety, which is important to work through, right? But we can hide behind, you know, or I'm a high functioning alcoholic, right? So we can sometimes uh, also kind of like mash those words to, to, you know, because it looks good on the outside, right? Because I look good on the outside, then I can, you know, it's different than, it's not visible, right? Versus what's visible. So you could have a lot going on um, that's not visible, um, but people would not think any differently or, you know, versus, you know, someone who visibly has a difference and we think, oh, they're disabled or, oh, um, there's something wrong with them, right? Because our mind goes to that preconceived um, notion of that. These are so um kind of getting into gonna share my screen again. Thank you, Pamela. And yeah, please keep talking in the chat. You're a chatty bunch, which is always great because you know on these webinars, people get webinared out and they're like, oh God, I'm just gonna take my camera off and not engage in the chat. And so I appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> gonna share my screen again. So Thinking um, about challenges, right? 
and going back to disclosure, right? We had a few examples of um, people disclosing and, you know, they took their medicine or we're not disclosing and kind of what that looks like is that, you know, the most substantial challenge here is that people don't view cognitive differences as diversity. Um, but in essence, diversity really is the acknowledgement and celebration of, of all differences. Um, but with neurodivergence, um, you know, there's a high probability that your coworker, your teacher, your neighbor might misunderstand um, their intention when they disclose. And so then the person, you know, it impacts um, the, these feelings of like belonging, but also um, safety um, and like psychological safety, right? Not just um, physical safety, but your psychological safety of being in there, in that, um, in that system, in that place. And, you know, also there's this idea too of is what they're struggling with or what they have consistent or episodic. Um, and so like, you know, ADHD, there can be, you know, fluctuations. And this kind of goes back to the, the diagnosis idea that, you know, why we don't diagnose people um, because, or why, you know, at work you wouldn't diagnose someone is, you know, before I give a, di like I would not diagnose someone with ADHD upon my first time seeing them, right? It's a kind of lengthier process because a lot of the time it is about, um, is this something that is showing up over time in, you know, two or more places, like not just work, but also work and home? Um, what is the, the frequency? What is the onset? What is the severity of your symptoms? So there's like a lot of nuances that come into play. Um, and, you know, with disclosure is that this is a, is a personal, you know, decision for the person, right? Um, a lot of the time, you know, we can do what's in our control as in the workplace, right? Of making um, it an open-minded and safe place, right? Um, but sometimes people might not disclose because of their accessibility to accommodations or they might, um, you know, have had a bad past experience with being open. Um, and so they worry that this is gonna like shift the power dynamic and you know, they'll be like a subordinate or they'll be looked at negatively. So um, we, you know, so kind of thinking through that and we've shared a lot, a lot of really good examples that we're sharing, you know, and please continue to share in the chat of how we can share with each other, you know, some examples of how we've done this in the past where someone has talked to us and maybe disclosed um, their neurodivergence and what we've said or some, you know, suggestions of what we could say. Um, and we're going to get towards that um, also kind of in a minute. Um, thinking through uh, challenges, but then considerations and accommodations, right? So, you know, really kind of, you know, which we already are, have made such wonderful strides on is you know, use some more inclusive language, but also thinking about environmental needs that, you know, we might not even consider, right? Like, um, as a normally, not normally, but you just wouldn't consider, right? Um, so, like, dimmer switch for lights, like, people might, you know, really bright lights might, um, if they have a sensory perception, might not be helpful. Or having a quieter room to, you know, a lot of people, um, are not wanting to go back into offices because they really enjoy being home where it's really quiet. Maybe they don't have any disruptions. They don't have people popping in. Um, and, you know, sometimes it could be that it really does help them um, with focus and with um, getting tasks done where being in a really busy work environment and you're constantly having, you know, simulation, it's hard to focus on something or one thing at a time. Um, Kind of thinking through written instructions uh, versus recorded instructions versus even visual, uh, more of like a visual, like you know, pictures or something that you know, like as a smart art. Um, flexibility in the workday to maximize peak performance. Again, you know, people might necessarily have thought of work from home beneficially because they can maybe they're really great at working from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Right. For a lot of people, they're like, that is just crazy town USA. Like, that is not how I roll. I'm an eight to five person. 
um, but some people do their best work from at night, right? Some people do their best work at from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. So really encouraging too, and kind of thinking through with your team um, is what is your peak performance, right? When can you really uh, do those like harder tasks and plan your workday around that? Um, again, you know, without compromising, like, you know, still need to go to that 2 p.m. meeting because, you know, there is still like a normal work day for different things, but how can we really think through creatively in terms of your tasks? Um, and again, image-based task lists for people who are more visual, um, headphones for auditory simulation, um, and really just, you know, meeting people where they are and their needs. And a lot of these things can be really simple shifts and really small shifts that um, just like make a world of difference. Um, and really just, you know, you could see, you know, big performance gains and um, for people. And there are a lot of benefits, right, in the workplace. Um, like someone had said earlier, you know, her son reading is, you know, not as, um, but, or math, I forgot which one it was, <laughs> but he's really good at the other. Um, well, you know, in general, um, there's a lot of talents that can be leveraged right, is, you know, a fresh perspective, innovative capabilities, um, you know, people that have, look at things, if they're, whose brains work differently, um, like people who, you know, I'll use the ADHD example, and focus, you know, when they're focusing, and they're, you know, have what they need, there could be a really keen accuracy and ability to de dictate, de detect errors, right, um, and really be able to concentrate um, and really appreciate routine and repetition or have technical strengths or, you know, be really reliable and have really strong recall. So it's really just, again, you know, meeting people where they are and what they need. And you can really reap the benefits in the workplace of like, wow, there's like so much um, that is there and that you never even notice. Um, and um, they can then really, really grow in their own engagement too of the workplace and what they do and what they like. So in quality improvement and really, you know, there's so much positive and benefit that can come from, from this and from having these conversations and really understanding how different people's brains work. And really kind of not celebrating and embracing uh, neurodiversity. Um, and so, you know, just really want to kind of use the rest of our time to really brainstorm and think about, you know, how we can connect with people in our lives, right? Whether, you know, colleagues, um, primarily uh, for the sake of the work we're doing today, but, you know, also our families and friends to celebrate neurodiversity and continue to be having these conversations and understanding more. Um, but also, again, of course, like in the context of we're not in the diagnosis game, right? Um, but, you know, how can we be having the conversations in an empathetic manner um, to really celebrate how different people think? Um, and there's also some some resources that aren't on the, the PowerPoint that I'll put into the chat too. And then um, I can, you know, we can talk about other, other resources and, but yeah, I just really want to open it up for um, conversation and for us to brainstorm with each other about that and ask questions and, and learn from each other. I would just add that I think, um, that I think a lot of this revolves around um, sometimes managers who don't really have emotional intelligence. They don't really, they have a difficulty um, from their perspective if they're very task focused and um, which is very important in today's environment because we're all under so much pressure to do tasks and to get things done. But what happens as a result of that is sometimes then managers, it's like they're looking just for those people who can just churn it out and do the task at of whatever it is that they want them to do at that moment, instead of looking at individuals and saying, wow, they're really gifted in this, or I could 
you know, and what I have found is when you ask your employees questions about why did they think that way? What, what, what way did they approach it? How would they approach it and everything? You oftentimes find there's, they're very unique. They have certain ways of approaching things that are actually more efficient or effective. Um, but what has happened so much is in our environment, it's so much about productivity and the constant churn that we don't take any time to work with the folks that, that report to us that, um, and, and, and in turn, the people above us who really don't want to know our ideas on how to get something done that more effectively or efficiently or, or another approach to something. And I do think that that's a big issue right now, particularly in the environments we're all working in. Yes, I'm really, really glad you brought up the emotional intelligence factor, right? Like that is huge and something that I see, you know, in my practice and work like all the time and, you know, want to do a skills group about it. And to your point, across the board, right? It's very, it can be a barrier to wanting to understand and address when we do live in a very task um focused and efficiency focused, um, metric focused um, world, right? And so I think then some of those systems too, um, like the task list, like timers, um, and actually a lot of um, kind of ADHD tools and resources we often use can actually be really applicable and helpful across teams um, in terms of um, productivity. But also, I think to your point, asking this question in our to ourselves and our teams about the why of what we're trying to achieve, right? Um, because so often we do put our heads down and we think, I was told I need to get to 10 because I'm at nine, right? Well, why does that matter? Why is that important? Um, and being able to think about that too, um, to help people think creatively creatively about that also um, is helpful. Does anybody else, have they seen kind of this um, emotional intelligence um, kind of opportunity in their environments that they want to speak to or things that they've, you know, been trying that have been helpful or things they'd want to dig in more to? Um, we talked a little bit about strengths before, and um, although I'm retired, you know, one of the things that I always did is I focused on strengths. And in focusing on strengths, it really, within the team, it really helped to try to uh, keep a level playing field, so to speak, and to get the most out of our team, really focusing on those strengths and being aware of where I was along with all of the different strengths as well. So it's being aware of self and being aware of other strengths as well. And when you can look at that and trying to meet the goals and the needs within the environment, I found that it always did help. Yeah, and there's a, um, has anyone, anyone familiar with Strength Finder? It's a Strength Finder. Okay. Is um, like a book and a, a, like um, a test that you can take, or not a test, but something you can take with your team. I've taken it with teams before. Um, and it looks at what your strengths are and then it was super helpful um, in looking at your strengths um, in synergy with your team um, and how they play together and um, what like gives you really good, you know, kind of does the work for you um, in helping kind of navigate that. Um, and so that's super helpful. It's called Strengths Finder. 
Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I love that you had mentioned synergy because when, when we can get to synergy the first time, we, I think it's something that we want to recreate again and again. Exactly. And, it, you know, it's what it's, I, you know, I kind of like to call being in your window of tolerance, right? So I discuss this with my clients and therapy is this idea of your window of tolerance is where you're calm, you're engaged, you're connected, you're in synergy, right? It's basically where you want to be all day, every day. Uh -huh. the, the reality is that life yeah. gets lifey and things get thrown at you. And so you end up going into like a hyper arousal, which is anxiety, fight or flight, right? Or hypo, which is numbing out, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the idea of what we can do to be identifying when we're going up or down and what others on our team need, right? To identify also um, to help all of us get back into that window and that zone, right? And it, it speaks to also um, when, you know, people and how they, how they work and how they think, right? In terms of connecting and engaging where if they get stressed out really easily by um, a lot of things thrown at them at once, right? And that makes them anxious. It's like noticing that, right? To know, okay, well, like someone said in the chat here, um, like OneNote, right? Or things like that, you know, having those tools handy to help people get kind of back in their window right? And have those resources uh, accessible. Thank you. Um, and yeah, Sarah, thank you. Yeah, yes. That's, thank you so much for sharing about that. OneNote is, is great. Evernote is also great. There is no short, and that's also the problem when you have ADHD too, is picking one because there are so many and then you get into a uh, total uh, analysis paralysis of what uh, thing to use to organize your life. So I would just recommend just, just pick one and see how it works and go from there. OneNote is great. Thank you, George. This is so helpful. As a DAI professional with a son who is ASD, I strongly encourage managers to consider alternative work environments that would allow neurodivergent employees to thrive. Despite many students struggling during the COVID quarantine, the lack of distraction and judgment helped my son to the Junior Honor Society. There are many challenges with interactions with peers, but he's still excelling academically. That's amazing. Thank you. Yes, strength finder, connectedness, maximizer, um, strategist. And there's a, a website, Sudharma. That I'll share with Kyle after of different resources that he can send out. Also circling back to the question about um, seasonal depression. Well, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, but I so enjoyed being here and thank you again so much for everyone for being so open and all the great dialogue and ideas um, that you have for each other. And it's a great group. And so, yeah, I just really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. That was excellent. Um, <clears throat> really informative. It was really great. And I appreciate um, the membership as well for being really interactive. And I think that made it really um I got a lot of good out of it, and it was nice to hear everyone speaking through it. So thank you guys so much. Um, you can put a little thank you in chat for Marissa. Um, we will get some of these um, resources and send them out. I'll, we'll have a list of those who attended um, so we can get those out for everybody after um, after the meetings ended today. So uh, a couple quick housekeeping things before I adjourn. As promised before, we're going to announce the winner um, of the vote after and with, I believe, uh, 
57% of the vote, Nina Sims has been elected uh, to the board. So thank you all very much um, for your votes and participation in that. Um, and then as a way of advertising our upcoming uh, webinar Wednesday series on Wednesday, July the 19th, our next webinar will be with Dr. Dr. Marta Squadrito, Managing Your Best Talent Through Neurodivergent Employees, which I think will very be a very good jumping off point from this um, webinar today. And then on Wednesday, August the 16th, we'll have um, Tamara Faraby, and she's going to do one uh, presentation on positivity. Um, and keeping a positive mind. So be on the lookout. We will have our announcements and registrations for those uh, coming up within the next week or so. Um, are there any other questions or comments before we adjourn? Just quick comment from your social media chair. Uh, please uh, follow the links that are on the chat uh, to follow our LinkedIn and Facebook page, if you have any questions, my contact information is in the chat. Feel free to reach out. Um, thank you guys for showing up today. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, yes, we will email out um, information as well after. So if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and call this meeting adjourned at 1139. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in July again. It should be a great one again in July. Yes, yeah, we okay. are excited. Okay.